He also has another book in progress called Complexities of Consciousness. The speaker also has written a number of essays focusing in cognitive development, metaphilosophy, and knowledge of consciousness. Some of their titles being Acting Contrary to Our Professed Belief, Unreliability of Naive Introspection, and In-Between Belief. His topics generally bring into question the black and white world of belief, consciousness, and self-knowledge. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor of Philosophy at UC Riverside, Dr. Eric Schwitzkabel. Sometimes I wander around a little bit. I've got a uh, you know, PowerPoint. You might not be able to see it. It probably doesn't matter very much. Uh, you've got the handout. Let's see. Can you hear me if I wander like this? Okay, I guess probably still. Uh, all right. Let's see. Is that any use at all, or should I just turn it off? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Um, so uh, philosophers tend to be pretty impressed about human self-knowledge. Uh, Descartes thought that our knowledge of our own stream of experience was the secure and indubitable foundation upon which to build our knowledge of the rest of the world. Hume, who was capable of being skeptical about almost anything, said that the only existences of which we can be certain are our sensory and imagistic experiences. One of the uh, central aims of Sidney Shoemaker's work on self-knowledge has been to show that certain sorts of error are impossible. Dave Chalmers has likewise attempted to show uh, that for a suitably constrained class of beliefs about one's own consciousness, error is impossible. Even philosophers most of the community thinks of as pessimistic about self-knowledge of our consciousness seem to me really to be fairly optimistic. Paul Churchland, famous for his disdain of ordinary uh, people's knowledge about the mind, compares the accuracy of introspection with the accuracy of sense perception. Uh, pretty good, presumably, uh, about medium-sized nearby matters. Dan Dennett, who's often cited as a pessimist about introspective report, actually says that we can come close to infallibility when we're charitably interpreted. So that's about consciousness. Another domain in which uh, philosophers have tended to be impressed with our self-knowledge is our attitudes, such as our beliefs and desires. This is the kind of thought that has impressed uh, many philosophers as requiring some explaining. Although I can be wrong about its being sunny outside, I can't in the same way be wrong about the fact that I think it's sunny outside. Some philosophers have argued that this accuracy is due to the operation of a fairly simple and straightforward self-detection mechanism that takes our attitudes as inputs and produces beliefs about those attitudes as outputs. A mechanism so simple that it rarely errors. Others have argued that our attitudes, at least some of them, can contain each other in self-fulfilling way so that my thought or belief that I think or believe that it's sunny in some sense literally contains as a part the thought or belief that it's sunny. Sidney Shoemaker has said things along roughly these lines, although his, his uh, account is, is more subtle, and uh, Fred Dretzky also uh, alluded to this sort of view, the view uh, earlier uh, today. From Descartes to the present, the philosophical literature on self-knowledge of consciousness of attitudes, self-knowledge of consciousness and of attitudes, has focused, with a few exceptions, on statements of or attempted explanations of the fact that we know ourselves remarkably well. Even those portrayed as skeptical have mostly been exercised to concoct bizarre or pathological scenarios designed to show that although our self-knowledge may be excellent, it's not completely infallible. So the, the center of the debate has mostly been between infallibilists and uh, not quite infallibilists. I'm 
however, inclined to think that we don't know our own stream of consciousness or our own attitudes very well at all. So let's start by thinking about currently ongoing conscious experience. Suppose you're looking directly at a bright red object in good viewing conditions. You judge that you're having a visual experience of red. How could you possibly be wrong about that? The infallibilist suggests. Or suppose someone has just dropped a 60 pound barbell on your toe and you judge that you're in pain. How could you possibly be wrong about that either? Well, uh, in such cases, I'm inclined to think it is highly unlikely that one would go wrong. But the question is this. How representative are such cases? Does the apparent difficulty of going wrong about color and pain experiences in canonical conditions reflect the general security of our judgments about our ongoing stream of conscious experience? Or are those cases exceptional, best cases? Optimists about our self-knowledge of our conscious experience tend to focus with amazing regularity, in fact, on exactly the experiences of seeing red and feeling pain. By focusing on those cases and then generalizing from there, they're implicitly treating those cases as representative and typical. So I'd like to start somewhere else for a change. So close your eyes and, and form a visual image. You can feel free to actually do this if you want, but if you're too embarrassed, you don't have to, of course. So imagine, for example, see, I'm closing my eyes. I'm modeling. Imagine, for example, <laughs> the front of your house as viewed from the street. Assuming you can, in fact, form such imagery, some people say they can't, consider this. How well do you know, right now, that imagery experience? You know, I assume, that you have an image, and you know some aspects of its content. You know that it's your house, say, from a particular point of view. But that's not really to say very much yet about your imagery experience. So let's think of some further questions. How much of the scene can you vividly visualize at once? Can you keep the image of the chimney vividly in mind at the same time you vividly imagine the front door? Or does the chimney fade as you start to think about the door? How much detail does your image have? How stable is it? Supposing you can't visually imagine the entire front of your house in rich detail all at once, what happens to the aspects of the image that are relatively less detailed? If the chimney, for example, is still experienced as part of your imagery, when your image-making energies are focused, as it were, on the front door, how exactly is that chimney experienced? Does it have a determinate shape, determinate color? In general, do the objects in your image have determinate colors before you think to assign color to them? Or do some of the colors of your image remain indeterminate, at least for a while? If there is indeterminacy of color, how is that indeterminacy experienced? As gray? Does your visual image have depth in the same way your sensory visual experience does? If it does, some people think sensory visual experience looks flat. Or is your imagery somehow flatter, more picture-like, more two-dimensional? Is your imagery located in subjective space? Does it seem in some way as though it's inside your head or in front of your forehead or in front of your eyes? Or does it seem wrong to say that there's some subjective experience of, experience of the image as located in some uh, relative to an egocentric position? 
How much is your 